It's Thanksgiving, and you know what I'm thankful for? Another new OBS version already. Wait, wait, what? The team is on the ball this year, and with OBS Studio version 29, even I actually got to help. It was only a wee, wee tiny bit. But look, Mom, I'm famous! OBS 29 is in beta testing on their GitHub if you want to download it, try it out, and give any bug reports or issues you have in their Discord or forums. But remember, this is not a full release just yet. They usually beta test for a month or so, so maybe don't overwrite your main streaming copy of OBS just yet. New features benefit nearly everyone here, so let's talk encoders first. OBS 28.1 added NVENC AV1 encoder support for owners of NVIDIA's new RTX 4000 series graphics cards. Well, OBS 29 adds both AV1 encoders for AMD, RDNA 3 GPUs, which aren't even out yet, and Intel Arc GPUs. Intel AV1 doesn't fully support CQP recording in OBS just yet, which is a bummer, but it will be improved on over time as we go. It's there, it just doesn't have, you know, the, the official support levels of polish yet. This is exciting. My primary capture and streaming rig is running Arc now, as it's the cheapest way to get high quality AV1, H.264, or H.265 video encoding, and will only get cheaper with the upcoming A310 graphics card. Support in OBS came late, given that Nvidia has launched later and already has support built in, but I'm still stoked. Plus, Intel users now have a new HEVC encoder to play with too, even for newer iGPU users of Intel's processors. I have a lot of testing to talk about with this update with Intel AV1 in a future video, but it's very good. Obviously, RDNA 3 hasn't released yet, so can't really talk about that yet, but it's been really tough to get anyone to agree to send out samples, despite the high demand for me to test these things, so we'll see as always. But if you don't have the latest and greatest hardware, you can still use the software AV1 encoders supported in OBS Studio, which also just got updated to their latest versions, bring in some much needed speed increases, though it is still intense. Those of you on Intel 10th or 11th gen processors or the new AMD Ryzen 7000 series processors will see SVT AV1 running a little more nicely due to its apparent acceleration with AVX 512 instruction sets. The thing Intel abandoned. Wild stuff. If you use the simple output mode, the NVENC profile configuration got bumped to the P5 preset to have better compatibility and performance for the average user. Doesn't affect you if you use the advanced mode though, just a nice little, if simple mode wasn't working right, it might run a little smoother now for you. Over on the macOS side of things, native HEVC and ProRes encoders have been added, which also adds support for the P010 color space and HDR recording. This is huge, and it even works on my M1 Mac Mini, which I didn't think had hardware ProRes encoding support. This is huge for my Mac-based tutorials on analog dreams and stream guides moving forward. I am beyond stoked. Apple's hardware encoder also got added to the auto configuration wizard on macOS 2, where it wasn't before, which is good for new users. The replay buffer for clips and instant replay functionality finally gets a bigger buffer, now allowing for up to 75% of your total installed system memory, where it was limited to 8 gigabytes before, regardless of how much RAM you had. While using HEVC or AV1 really means that you don't need to use that much RAM anymore for replay buffers, as the clips I was capturing for my last video on the crazy encoding possibilities had me getting over a minute of 1440p 360 FPS video only taking up about 1.74 gigabytes. But it's still nice to have that control as I've certainly been limited by it before. Audio sees lots of improvements in this update too, including a couple of the things that I kind of helped with. First, the wonderful PKV developed an upward compressor filter based on my video about that. You can watch the full thing linked down below, but upward compression is the process of taking the quietest parts of your sound and squishing them up into the middle and louder parts. This is useful for game streams with lots of dynamic range that keep viewers from easily being able to hear, say, footsteps or other, you know, quieter details in your game that you might be reacting to and your viewers can't hear, or for helping m manage balance uh, with, say, a big multi-person voice call on Discord or something like that. This rules. Secondly, a three-band equalizer was added to give users more quick and easy control over their sound without the need for a complicated VST plugin or something like that. The next feature I helped with involved documenting every capture card that I still have, that I have tested, and even some that I haven't tested, which is a lot. This allowed them to be whitelisted in a way that you can automatically capture audio from the capture cards without having to specify the use custom audio device option and then find the specific input on your capture device and so on. An annoyance I frequently reported in my capture card reviews. I may not code beyond 
some super basic things, but I have a lot of capture cards, so I can definitely contribute some documentation. Speaking of capture devices, my last contribution here was a similar documentation thing, which now allows for higher frame rates to be selected from your capture devices that support capturing frame rates, like 120 FPS at 1440p or 240 FPS at 1080p. While you could generally still capture these frame rates on supported devices by choosing the highest FPS option, this gives a little more control and transparency into what's actually, you know, happening with your captures, which is pretty rad. I'll link my Google Sheet spreadsheet with capture card support documentation in the description down below, but examples of cards like this include the Avermedia Live Gamer 4K or the Elgato 4K 60 Pro, both of which support actually capturing the full frame rate of 144 FPS at 1440p or 240 FPS at 1080p. I'll have a dedicated video detailing this at some point too, as usual. Back over in macOS land, the desk view feature of showing both your face and your desk at the same time via an iPhone 11 or later is now supported. This is weird. I, I, I honestly wasn't expecting them to support it since it's mostly limited to FaceTime, but it's very rad. I'm going to play around with this some more since... My, my phone is at the bottom tier of what's supported here. <laughs> Various sources and filters got little tweaks too. For example, the NVIDIA video and audio filters got some plenty of tweaks overall, but one of them is the mask refresh slider for the background removal filter. The big one here is support for the new temporal processing for background removal that uses AI over time, processing your frames over time to have much higher accuracy and much less flickering, say if someone randomly walks through your frame. This does require the latest NVIDIA Video FX SDK uh, to use the new feature, so you will have to update, though if you don't update, the rest of everything will still function as expected, but links to that update will be in the description down below. Display Capture now has better screen naming and saving, so it shouldn't keep mixing up your display capture sources whenever you launch OBS, as it often does for me if I've disconnected and reconnected any displays since using it. It's been a super big headache. Hopefully this keeps that locked down. The previously updated Screen Capture Kit capture method over on macOS is now disabled for macOS 12 because it seems to not be working right for a lot of macOS 12 users, so you'll either have to update to version 13 to get that option back or just use the normal screen capture source for now on macOS 12 which is fine. Browser docs can now be muted individually, which is absolutely great, as I had to stop using things like my Trovo chat doc because they kept embedding some sort of weird video advertisement or promo that just played sound into my stream. It was really annoying. Not OBS's problem, but they added the fix. Browser docs also support the browser inspector too, just like a normal web browser. The image slideshow source now has a slide counter in the toolbar, which is very awesome for keeping track of your overlays or whatever you're using the slideshow for. SRT and RIST outputs now support encryption and authentication. This is a new streaming protocol that is mostly only supported on the enterprise or corporate side of things at the moment, but I would love to see YouTube support it soon and you know, getting it fully supported in OBS is one more step towards that theoretically being a possibility. The dynamic bitrate setting that helps adjust bandwidth when your internet starts acting up has now been adjusted from 30 second increments to four second increments to help it adapt to your knees even quicker which I've actually had to use a couple times, despite having gigabit fiber. <laughs> Lastly, the team is working on a new updater configuration, allowing you to opt in to receiving beta builds of OBS through the in-app updater automatically, like how the normal updater works for full releases. This may not fully work until later in the beta testing period, as they have to, you know, get finished the server setups and all of that kind of thing, but it's very cool. What's also cool is my Retrowave themed pins, stickers, and high quality desk mats that are available for a Black Friday weekend sale, 20% off from, I believe tonight, if not Black Friday, you know, midnight through Cyber Monday. And then they are gone for good. I will not be selling these again, so don't miss them. Obviously this update was primarily AV1 encoder heavy, but there is a lot of little awesome stuff packed in here, and I am stoked to see another big upgrade so soon, especially now that more plugins are updating for new builds. Compatibility list linked below. Join us on Discord, follow me on Mastodon or Space Hey, and remember to be kind, rewind.